be God. Um, yes, I'd be delighted to do that. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, let me repeat what I just said. So, Tom Rockwell's work in onshore dating um, have yielded information about the minimum slip rates of about 1.5 millimeters per year. Long-term geologic rates of looking at stream offsets in the Bay Point Formation, a Pleistocene Formation, yield about two millimeters per year. So we have uh, little constraint on some of the history uh, of the faulting offshore. We do have some as it goes into the Newport Englewood region. So we'd like to characterize here offshore where sediment is more continuous in the marine environment. We have a greater chance of uh, recovering these sediment lenses and determining the history of faulting and how often these faults moved in the past. It could be really interesting. It could have a lot of implications for the rest of the region, too. The, um, I don't know if everyone knows, the Newport and Good Rose Canyon goes from downtown San Diego to just west of downtown Los Angeles. There's a significant seismic hazard to both places. And we know a little bit about its overall slip rate and, and potential for earthquakes. But um, a better constrained slip rate would help understand seismic hazard at the plant and other places we care about. And Graham's work, um, some of the imagery that's coming back from the reprocess is putting much better constraints on the dip of the Rose Canyon. And we know very little of how this dip changes from south to north along the trend of this fault. And we hope that's another realization of this work. Okay. Are there any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Um, I had a couple of questions. Um, but I think you have to come to, so somebody won't yell to you to speak up. You might oh, want to. I don't want to be yelled at. No, I was. I wasn't tickled. Mm -hmm. <laughs> don't want to be yelled at. A um, couple of questions about this testing that you have scheduled to start in August. Um, was I correct in hearing that you mentioned you're going to be using a Sparker system for the 3D, um, or was that for both? Um, for the for the 2D survey, we're going to um, we're working with other colleagues. We're going to look at the signature of a boomer and a sparker system. And these are both low energy, less than 1.6 kilojoules. And so right now, we're going to let science and source signature and resolution drive that decision. Okay. So um, I'm familiar with both of those technologies and. Uh, the potential for their uh, the, the source levels. So, with especially in the 3D, um, you know, I'll, I'll beg to differ with you. I don't particularly look at those as low energy. Um, can you tell me what the source levels in in hertz and decibels are for both of those systems, and the the decibel levels and the hertz that you plan on utilizing, especially in your 3D program? Yep. So first, I'll speak to the frequency content. So these systems, they image down hundreds of meters. Um, they'll image, we're targeting the top 500 meters. And the frequency range is going to be in the order of about um, 40 to 80, maybe 90 um, hertz. Okay, so um, we consider this and the roll off and where the notch frequency is depending on where you tow the guns. So this will be um, what the California State Lands Commission um, defines as low energy. It's below the 1.6 kilojoules. And it will be uh, designed, um, we'll have uh, protected species observers according to the uh, guidelines from National Marine Fisheries on board. So we're doing everything we've done, um, environmental impact studies, so that we can actually look at the windows there's least impact to uh, mammals and protected species. So we're trying to do everything in our power to acquire this information and minimize impact to the marine environment. Oh, DBs though, you forgot to tell us the DBs. I'm gonna let you know, uh, yeah, this is, well. Um, <laughs> source, well, uh, no, but, source and receive levels are very But, but DBs, uh, DBs. Uh, can you tell me who was just speaking? This is Professor Neil Driscoll. 
Thank you. Okay, so here, dBs uh, depend on proximity to the source, and it's, uh, it's complicated, and to go through this would take time. Yeah, no, I just want to know the source level dBs. I'm not asking for receive levels. Right, so right okay. at the source. We just, it's, yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> okay. So, um, again, this is low energy. Yes. Let's just go to high energy for a minute because there's some misnomers. And um, when they talk about source levels, they talk about some idealized at one meter. So, for example, a high energy survey might be at 250 dB. If you were to go out because it has a footprint, if you're going to go out and try to measure 250, you'll never find 250. You won't find 240. You won't find 230. You might not find 220 or 210 because the source has a footprint and the 1 dB level is. Is, is that one, the dB levels for, for I, if you shrink it all down. To give you an idea is some of the low energy uh, equipment we've used in the past, the ship's engines are louder. And, and that's the reason, wait, let, me, so, let me add one thing to that. It's, it's, let me add one thing to that. answer my question. <laughs> well, it, it's not a, it, so, so here, um, the reason we're, we're going to test between these two systems is the, engine and the type of uh, propeller screws on our, our ships are different and the Melville has a, a cyclone type propeller that emits energy at 40 to 60 hertz that's much louder than the system okay? and so what we're worried about is that's going to interfere with it so we're, we're doing due diligence to figure the best source to get the best resolution data and um, we'll be happy to talk to you and send you reports and details. But to just come up here and discuss dB, it's not that it's not such a simple thing. 216 dB is the last sparker, is what I can tell you. What size sparker? That will, I'll I'll give you the. the you know, as a matter of fact, they have it. I, I think that's fair enough. That's yeah. okay. Okay. Richard Sidowski, uh, Coast Alliance. Um, I appreciate your the scientists. I work with scientists on DARPA projects and in the rocket industry and understand a lot of times there's a desire to get data, but at what cost? Uh, one of the things that I'm kind of concerned or wondering about is you mentioned that you get about 80 to 95% recovery from the Chevron data that you have. and. This is more of a comment. It seems to me that the impact, uh, environmental impacts that we're looking at caused by high energy and low energy, which is not so low energy, impacts on the uh, environment and marine mammals is a little too high, in my opinion. And also, regarding the schedule for this um, particular project. Uh, currently there is a lot of discussion in legislature and a lot of the COCAT agencies that are involved, um, uh, like the State Lands, Ocean Protection Council, uh, Coastal Commission. Seems to me like the permitting process is getting reviewed and uh, if nothing else, I think there should be a stay on any kind of uh, permit issue for any uh, seismic testing until those uh, legislative issues get resolved. Thank you. John Giesman, Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility. Uh, did I understand you correctly that your, your surveys are all going to be outside the three mile limit? For the the two D So for the high energy surveys, the two D deep as we discussed and we met with the IPRG and the CPUC is the first survey we can uh, acquire information about whether we can image the oceanside blind thrusts in Newport Englewood intersection, Rose Canyon intersection at depth, without going into the three mile limit. So here, once again, 
Um, this illustrates we're trying to minimize impact. We can determine whether a 3D deep survey is warranted by gathering this data, and there could be an exit ramp. For the shallow, low energy data, we will, we will go inside the three mile limit because we want to capture the Rose Canyon fault system and that dances right on the shelf edge slope and moves in and out of the three mile limit. So yes, we will on the shallow data be moving into state waters. So does that dance go north of the plant up toward Newport Beach? Or are you speaking of the dance where the uh, north. fault runs collinear with the... Right, so... North. So the regional survey will be within inside this dashed box and it will proceed. Um, this box runs right along state federal water boundary. So we will be surveying the Newport Englewood Rose Canyon fault where it goes here, it's outside the three mile limit, here it goes inside, but when you acquire seismic data, you need to have the target of interest bounded with certain data uh, uh, east of it, so that the, the um, as Caroline stated earlier, the faults of interest and their location are being directed by tornado plots and ground motion studies and what impacts the seismic setting at the plant. The plant shown here will be going up further north and further south, so this box has been delineated by other studies that tell us what are the most sensitive parameters to know. Well, I'm a bit at a disadvantage because I think this is the first IPRG meeting that's actually been publicly noticed, so I don't know what was discussed before. I had a question for Caroline uh, as to why the source characterization shack workshop was not made open to the public in the way in which PG&E's shack workshops have been. So um, we are following the NRC process for conducting the shacks, and the shacks allow for uh, a series of technical experts from all over to come in and have an open dialogue about their perspectives, present their proponents' view, and uh, there's advocacy and other things. We want to have that environment um, for them to discuss things openly and uh, not have things taken out of context. And so we have we have follow the process to allow for the, the IPRG to participate, to ensure we are following the process, and we also are providing all that information to the public as it becomes um, generated. My last question is for the PUC staff. Is there some reason why the uh, paleo-seismic paleo trenching report has not been made available to the public yet? Uh, we, we, as I indicated this morning, I believe, or, or earlier, we will be putting it on our website. But you got it in January. Yes, but because of the large size of it and the, the megabytes, and uh, it, it takes time to get it on our on our website. But we will do it. hear anything the answer was it will be on the PUC website is this the person to whom I'm speaking <laughs> <laughs> Marla Dovertine um, Coast Alliance um, th this is quite fascinating and I can see your fascination with the work that you're doing by sitting in here. I, I can ride, run, ride along with you, you know, and uh, speaking about us being visual creatures and, you know, we're driving through this 3D landscape and all that. And it, it, in a sanitized condition, sitting here in this air-conditioned building, 
uh, it, it's fascinating. However, the creatures, the critters, who live in the environment that you're um, blasting away or with acoustic sound, a, a lot of the mammals are primarily uh, live by their hearing. So um, it's a bit hard for me, really. I'm fascinated, and I can see where, wow, you know, maybe I want to be a geologist here. But just, well, can you step back? And, and, and perhaps we can share some of our information with you on the environmental and the biological things that are going on with the the equipment that's being used here. We, we, we share your concerns, and I think there's a, a lot of environmentally active people in the geologic community. But we really need to focus these IPRT meetings on the seismic hazard and what we can learn about the seismic hazard um, from studies. And then if we think it's, it's valuable, then we pass that information along to other people who understand the biological impacts and have studied the, made careers of studying biological impacts. Because there really are people at the Coastal Commission and, and State Lands Commission who, who do that. And although, you know, we understand your concerns, we don't have the ability to do anything about them. With all due respect, I understand the position, and um, I believe that there's an ongoing trend in our national government and our state government to have interagency cooperation, collaboration, and innovative processes going forward. And any um, stumbling blocks that you may have to that that you've been dealing with, I've been in the professional world myself. I know that there are stumbling blocks, but there comes a time when we have to step up into the new millennium, and that's what I'm talking about here. And, and we can't be so focused and pinpointed that we lose the whole kingdom, you know? Um, I, I, I don't know. Question, question of certification, anybody here know anything about that? It's kind of important, it's very important. Can you predict an earthquake? Can you predict an earthquake? No, you can't, right? So, that's all I have to say. Excuse me for carrying me. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, anybody needs it? Mary Beth Brangan, Ecological Options Network. I'm new to whole, this whole, um, your, your parameters of your study, but are you adding to your uh, analysis um, the patterns of the apparent uptick of uh, earthquake activity in the Ring of Fire? Does this uh, get looked at? Mm -hmm. What's being analyzed here is, is, will be essentially a long-term seismic hazard, but on top of that is um, it's being compared with other terms of seismic hazard, and, and of course the you can um, I mentioned in our meetings earlier this today we're looking at the um, the region around the, the plant and the seismic hazard there and the parameters on sources there. We're comparing them in other models for bigger areas. I mentioned the national seismic hazard maps that we that cover all of California and all of the all of the country. And those those are looking at both long term and short term trends in, in, in seismicity and, and earthquake faults. And Thank so you. yeah. Well in um in, is part of that um looking at the um apparent balancing effect that, that happens when you have a major earthquake in one part of the globe the uh, another one in a balancing some, some of the analysis does consider the um, patterns of earthquakes and, and their potential for the changing the, the short-term patterns of earthquakes in other places, yes. Will any of that data be on the website too? But none of that is specific for these studies for this plant. What I'm talking about are more broad studies um, for the National Seismic Hazard Maps 
and that are part of what's called the Uniform California Earthquake Rupture Forecast, which is a joint um, USGS California Geological Survey Southern California Earthquake Center a publication that should be out in a couple of months. Are there any other public questions? We do have one administrative matter, and I mentioned it this morning at the IPRP meeting for Diablo Canyon, and that is when we want to schedule our next IPRP meeting. And it was suggested that we do hold regularly publicly noticed meetings, perhaps uh, qu uh, quarterly. Um, it was suggested that Monday seems to work better, and I'm also suspecting that if we can do uh, Diablo Canyon, pg and &E, you know, in the morning and discuss songs and have Edison come in in the afternoon, that seems to work, work best. Um, and I'll be working with the, you know, participants about trying to figure out, you know, what the the best dates uh, will be. So Edison can support that. Thank you. Can any phone people ask questions? Yes. If, if there's anyone on the phone that would like to ask a question, please speak up. And please identify yourself. Thank you. This is Bruce Campbell from Los Angeles. And I spoke with Chris Wills briefly at the at the November 28th NRC and other seismic research hearing in San Luis Obispo. And I was talking about what I see is from my studies of Central and Southern California seismicity and was emphasizing the, well, um, I'll get to the point, which is he pointed out that there's, that the Palos Verdes fault further to the west and is more or less parallel to Newport Inglewood has a higher slip rate than Newport Inglewood and yet I haven't heard Palos Verdes all mentioned once in this session. And does he or another one explain why? Um, I think Neil may be able to add, add something to this, but basically it's farther enough away that it has less effect on seismic hazard at the plant. It it's has potential for more, more earthquakes somewhat more frequently because it has, about, it has a higher slip rate, but it's, it's so much farther away that the, the impact on seismic hazard is lower. Do you know how much further away, and do you know about the, uh, that swarm of quakes in the area of the Palos Verdes Fault, perhaps where it crosses around the Santa Catalina Fault? I don't have a map in front of me to give you the, 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 the diff distance, and I'm not, I'm not familiar with the swarm of earthquakes you're mentioning. I, I can't place that one. It's an ocean side. Yeah. And I will try to forward this map to you. Okay. That's, yeah, there, there, there's been a couple of swarms of earthquakes offshore ocean side, and there's, and there's one of those that um, has been talked about ever since as, as something that could be on the ocean side blind thrust. Yes. And it's part of the part of the thought we're concerned about here. And then that December 14th quake, more or less west of San Onofre, has that been pinpointed? I don't know anything about that earthquake. I remember we were at LA City Hall dealing with San Onofre at the time, so it was sort of. Uh, Create. Yeah. Okay. Be nice to look into that as well as send you this map on the definite swarm of quakes. Seems to have the most biggest swarm of quakes offshore of Southern California in general, seem to be followed by an area south of Santa Barbara, which is also sort of ominous since that area may have produced that quake back in the 20s or 30s, which had the tsunami hit Santa Barbara. Okay. Okay, thank you for your question. Any other questions? I suppose with that, we'll... Um, just real quick closing. Um, just as I opened this morning, thank you to all the, the peer review panelists. Um, you know, your advice is invaluable. This is um, the first time I've had the opportunity, but will definitely not be the last to, um, to, to join the panel. Um, and it is highly informative. I know this is also the first time with 
Um, we've done the public meetings, um, and I've found some of the public questions and input very beneficial. I hope it's been beneficial for the public to, uh, uh, to view the discussion and ultimately decision-making process. Um, for future meetings, I think today went very well in terms of the questions being on point. Um, I would just like to you know, request people keep in mind the point of this panel is to be providing um, technical advice and counsel to the commission. Um, this is not the venue where we're balancing all of the issues where I want to get into fights over certain things. The questions today were 99% on point and that was great. Um, I just want to caution that and have people, if they're planning to travel here again or bring other people, just remember what the venue is and where we're going to try to keep the uh, conversation limited. It really is to provide the technical advice to the PUC um, as we continue to look at um, the actions the utilities make as far as the seismic studies with the, the nuclear plants. Thank you.